The Husband Under the Bed, An Extraordinary Adventure. One, be so kind, sir, allow me to ask you. The gentleman so addressed started and looked away with some alarm at the gentleman in raccoon fur furs who had accosted him so abruptly at eight o'clock in the evening in the street. We all know that if a Petersburg gentleman suddenly in, this, suddenly in the street speaks to another gentleman with whom he is unacquainted, the second gentleman is invariably in alarmed. And so the gentleman addressed started and was somewhat alarmed. Excuse me for troubling you, said the gentleman in raccoon, but I really don't know. You will pardon me, no doubt. You see, I'm a little upset. Only then the young woman, oh, excuse me. Only then, the young man in the wadded overcoat observed that this gentleman in the raccoon furs was certainly upset. His wrinkled face was ra rather pale, his voice trembling. He was evidently in some confusion of mind. His words did not flow easily from the tongue, and it could be seen that it cost him a terrible effort to present a very humble request to a personage, possibly his inferior in rank or condition, in spite of the urgent necessity of addressing his request to somebody. And indeed, the request was in any case unseemly, undignified, strange, coming from a man who had such a dignified fur coat, such a respectable jacket of a superb dark green color, and such distinguished decorations adorning that jacket. It was evident that the gentleman in raccoon was himself confused by all this, so that at last he could not stand it, but made up his mind to suppress his emotions, and politely put an end to the unpleasant position he himself had brought about. Excuse me, I am not myself, but it is true that you do not you don't know me. Forgive me for disturbing you. I have changed my mind. Here, from politeness, he raised his hat and hurried off. But allow me the little gentleman had, however, vanished into the darkness, leaving the gentleman in the wadded overcoat in a state of stupefaction. What a queer fellow, thought the gentleman in the wadded overcoat. After wondering, as it was only natural, and recovering at last from his stupefaction, he bethought him of his own affairs and began walking to and fro, staring intently at the gates of a house with an endless number of stories. A fog was beginning to come on, and the young man was somewhat relieved at it, for his walking up and down was less noticeable in the fog, though indeed no one could have noticed him, noticed him but some cabman who had been waiting all day without a fare. Excuse me. The young man sta started again. Again, the gentleman in the raccoon was standing before him. Excuse me again, he began, but you, you are in no doubt an honorable man. Take no notice of my social position, but I am getting muddled. Look at it as a man, to, look at it as, look at it as man to man. You see before you, sir, a man craving a humble favor. If I can, uh, what do you want? You imagine, perhaps, that I am asking for money, said the mysterious gentleman, with a wry smile, laughing hysterically and turning pale. Oh, dear, no. No, no, I see. I am tiresome to you. Excuse me, I cannot bear myself. Consider that you are seeing a man in an agitated condition, almost of insanity, and do not draw any conclusion. But to the point, to the point, responded the young man, nodding his head encouragingly and impatiently. Now think of that. A young man like you reminding me to keep the, to the point, as though I were some, as I were some heedless boy. I must need, I must certainly be doting. How can I seem to you in, in my dis degraded position? Tell me frankly. The young man was overcome with confusion and said nothing. Allow me to ask you openly. Have you not seen a lady? That is all that I have to ask you, the gentleman in the raccoon coat said resolutely at last. Lady? Yes, a lady. Yes, I have seen, but I ha must say I lots of them have passed. Just so, answered the mysterious gentleman with a bitter smile. I muddled. I did not mean to ask that. Excuse me. I meant to say, haven't you seen a lady in a fox fur cape in a dark velvet hood and black veil? No, I haven't noticed one like that. No, I think I haven't seen one. Well, in that case, excuse me. The young man wanted to ask a question. But the gentleman in the raccoon vanished again. Again, he left his patient listener in a state of stupefaction. Well, the devil take him, thought the young man in the wadded overcoat, evidently troubled. 
With annoyance, he turned up his beaver collar and began cautiously walking to and fro again before the gates of the house of many stories. He was raging inward. Why doesn't he, she come out, he thought. It will soon be eight o'clock. The town clock struck eight. Oh, devil take you. Excuse me. Excuse me for speaking like that, but you came upon me so suddenly that you quite frightened me, said the young man, frowning and apologizing. Here I am again. I must strike you as tiresome and queer. Be so good as to explain at once, without any more ado. I don't know what, I what it is you want. You are in a hurry. Do you see? I will tell you everything, openly, without wasting words. It cannot be helped. Circumstances sometimes bring together people of very different characters. But I see you are an impatient young man. So here, though I really don't know how to tell you, I am looking for a lady. I have made up my mind to tell you about it. You see, but you see, I must know where the lady has gone, who she is. I imagine there is no need for you to know her name, young man. Well, well, what next? What next? What a tone you take with me. Excuse me, but I perhaps have offended you by calling you young man. But I have, but I had nothing... In short, you are very willing to do me a very great service. Here it is. A lady, that is, I mean a gentlewoman of a very good family of my acquaintance, I have commissioned. I have no family, you see. Oh, put yourself in my position, young man. Ah, I've done it again. Excuse me. I keep calling you young man. Only every minute is precious. Only fancy that lady. But cannot you tell me who lives in this house? But lots of people live here. Yes, that is, you are perfectly right, answered the gentleman in raccoon, giving a slight laugh for the sake of good manners. I feel I am rather muddled. But why do you take that tone? You see, I admit, frankly, that I am muddled, and however haughty you are, you have seen enough of my humiliation to satisfy you. I say a lady of honorable conduct, that is, of light tendencies. Excuse me, I am so confused. It is though I were speaking of literature. Paul de Kock, is supposed to be of light tendencies, and all the trouble comes from him, you see. The young man looked compassionately at the gentleman in raccoon, who seemed in a hopeless muddle, and pausing, stared at him with a meaningless smile, and with a trembling hand, for no apparent reason, gripped the la la pe lapet of his wadded overcoat. You ask me who lives here, the young said the young man, stepping back a little. Yes, you have told me lots of people live here. Here, I know that Sophia Ostamdea lives here too, the young man brought out brought out in a low and even commiserating tone. There, you see, you see, you know something, young man. I assure you I don't. I know nothing. I judged from your troubled air. I have just learned from the cook that she does come here, but you are on the wrong track tack, that is, with Sophia Ostavea. She does not know her she does not know her. No? Oh, I beg your pardon then. I see this is no, of no interest to you, young man, said the queer man with bitter irony. Listen, said the young man, hesitating. I really don't understand why you are in such a state. But tell me frankly, I suppose you are being deceived? The young man smiled approvingly. We shall understand one another anyway, he added, and his whole person loftily betrayed an inclination to make a half bow. You crushed me, but I frankly confess that it is, it is just it. But it... It happens to everyone. I am deeply touched by your sympathy. To be sure, among young men, though I am not young, but you know, habit, a bachelor life, among bachelors, we all know. Oh, yes, we know, all know, we all know. But in what can I, in what way can I be of assistance to you? Why, look here. Admit a visit to Sophia Ostenvea, though I don't know for a fact where the lady has gone. I only know that she is in, in that house. But seeing you walk up and down, and I am walking up and down on the same side myself, I thought, you see, I am waiting for that lady. I know that she is there. I would like to meet her and explain to her how shocking and improper it is. Uh, in fact, you understand me. Hmm? Well, I'm not acting for myself. Don't imagine it. It is another man's wife. Her husband is standing over there on the Vosnian Bridge. He wants to catch her, but he doesn't dare. He is still loath to believe it as every other hus every husband is. Here the gentleman in the raccoon made an effort to smile. I am a friend of his. You can see for yourself. I am a person held in some esteem. I could not be what you take me for. Of course. 
Well, well. Uh, so you see, I am on the lookout for her. The task has been entrusted to me, the unhappy husband, but I know that the, Paul, the young lady is sly, Paul de Kock, forever under her pillow. I am certain she scurries off somewhere on the sly. I must confess the cook told me she comes here. I rushed off like a madman as soon as I heard the news. I want to catch her. I have, I have long had suspicion, and so I wanted to ask you. You're walking here. You, you, I don't know. Come, what is it? What do you want? Yes, I have not the honor of your acquaintance. I do not venture to inquire who and what you may be. Allow me to introduce myself, anyways. Glad to meet you. The gentleman, quivering with agitation, sh warmly shook the young man's hand. I ought to have done this to begin with, he added, but I have lost all sense of good manners. The gentleman in raccoon could not keep standing still as he talked. He kept looking about him uneasily, fidgeting with his feet, and like a drowning man, clutched at the young man's hand. You see, he went on, I meant to address you in a friendly way. Excuse the freedom. I meant to ask you to walk along the other side and down the side street where there is a back entrance. I, too, on my side, will walk from the front entrance so that we cannot miss her. I'm afraid of missing her by myself. I don't want to miss her. When you see her, stop her and shout to me. But I'm mad. Only now I see the foolishness and imp impropriety of my suggestion. No, why, no, it's all right. Don't make excuses for me. I am so upset. I have never been in such a state before, as though I were being tried for my life. I must own indeed. I will be straightforward and honorable with you, young man. I actually thought you might be the lover. That is, to put it simply, you want to know what I am doing here? You are an honorable man, my dear sir. I am far from supposing that you are he. I will not insult you with such a suspicion. But give me your word of honor that you are not the lover. Oh, very well. I give you my word of honor that I am that I am a lover, but not of your wife. Otherwise, I shouldn't be here in the street, but should be with her now. Wife? Who told you that she was my wife, young man? I am a bachelor. That is, I am a lover myself. You told me that there there is a husband on Vosnia's bridge. Of course, of course. I am talking too freely, but there are other ties. And you know, young man, a certain lightness of character that is... Yes, yes, to be sure, to be sure. That is, I am not her husband at all. Oh, no doubt, but I tell you frankly that, in a reassuring you now, I want to set my own mind at rest, and that that is why I am candid with you. You are ups upsetting me, and in my way, I promise that I will call you, that I will call you, but I most humbly beg you to move further away and let me alone. I am waiting for someone too. Certainly, certainly. I will move further off. I respect the passion and patience of your heart. Oh, how well I understand you at this moment. Oh, all right, all right. Till we meet again. But excuse me, young man. Here I am again. I don't know how to say it. Uh, give me your word of honor once more, as a gentleman, that you are not her lover. Oh, mercy on us! Oh, one more question. The last. Do you know the surname of the husband of your, that is, the lady of whom, whom is the object of your devotion? Of course I do. It is not your name, and that is about all, that is about, about it. Why, how do you know my name? But, I say, you had better go. You are losing time. She might go away a thousand times. Why, what do you want? Your lady's in a fox cape and a hood, while mine is wearing a plaid coat and a pale blue velvet hat. What more do you want? What else? A pale blue velvet hat? She has, ne she has a plaid coat and a pale blue velvet hat, cried the pert pertinacious man, instantly turning back again. Oh, hang it all. Why, that way, why, that may well be. And indeed, my lady does not come here. Where is she then, your lady? You want to know that? What is it to you? I must own, I am still... The fool! Mercy on us! Why have you no sense of decency? None at all. Well, my lady has friends here on the third story looking into the street. Why do you want to tell me you... Why do you want me to tell you their names? My goodness! I have friends, too, who live on the third story, and their windows look onto the street. General... General? A general. If you like, I will tell you what the... Ge what general? Well, then, General Pos... Polosvinia. Polos... Polosin. Polo... Polo... Vitesin. Polo Vitesin. You don't say so. 
No, it is not the same. Oh, damnations, damnations. Not the same? No, not the same. Both were silent, looking at each other in perplexity. Why are you looking at me like that? exclaimed the young man, shaking off his stupefaction and the air of uncertain uncertainty with vexation. The gentleman was in a fluster. I, I must own. Come, allow me, allow me. Let us talk more sensibly now. It concerns us both. Explain to me, whom do you know there? You mean, who are my friends? Yes, your friends. Well, you see, you see, I see from your eyes that I have guessed right. Hang it all. No, no, hang it all. You are blind. Are you blind? Why am I standing before you? I am while you. Why? 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 I am standing here before you. I am not with her. Oh, well, I don't care whether you say so or not. Twice in his fury, the young man turned on his heel with a contemptuous wave of his hand. Oh, I mean nothing. I assure you, as an honorable man, I will tell you all about it. At first, my wife used to come here alone. They are relatives of hers. I, ha I had no suspicions. Yesterday, I met His Excellency. He told me that he had moved three weeks ago from here to another flat. And my that is, not mine, uh, somebody else's, uh, the husband's on the Vronsky Bridge, that lady had told me that she was with them the day before yesterday, in this flat, I mean. And the cook told me that His Excellency's flat had been taken by a young man called Boban Nitz. Sien. Oh, damn it all, damn it all! My dear sir, I am in terror. I am in alarm. Oh, hang it. What is it to me that you are in terror and in alarm? Ah, over there. Someone flitted by. Over there. Where, where? You just shout. You, you just, where, where? You just shout, Ivan Androvich, and I will run. All right, all right. Oh, confound it. Ivan Androvich! Here I am, cried Ivan Androvich, returning utterly breathless. What is it? What is it? Where? Oh, no, I didn't mean anything. I wanted to know what that, this, I wanted to know what that, what this lady's name is. Glaf, Gafliera? No, not Gafliera. Excuse me, I cannot tell you her name. As he said this, the worthy man was white as a sheet. Oh, of course it is not Glafliera. I know it is not Glafliera, and mine's not Glafliera. But with whom can she be? Where? There! Oh, damn it, damn it! The young man was in such a fury that he could not stand still. There, you see. How did you not? How did you know that her name was Glafira? Oh, damn it all, really. To have a bother with you, too. Why, you say... Why, you say that yours is not called Glafira. My dear sir, what a way, way to speak. Oh, the devil. As though that mattered now. What is she? Your wife. No, that is, I am not married, but I would not keep flinging the devil at a respectable man in trouble, trouble, a man, I will not say a worthy of, I am not, I will not say worthy of esteem, but at any rate, a man of education. You keep saying, the devil, the devil, to be sure, the devil take it, so that there you, so there that you are, so there you are, do you understand? You are blinded by anger, and I say nothing, oh dear, who is that? Where? There was a noise and a sound of laughter. Two pretty girls ran down the steps. Both the men rushed up to them. Oh, what manners! What do you want? Where are you shoving? Why are you shoving? They are not the right ones. Aha! So you've pitched on the wrong ones. Cab! Where do you want to go, mademoiselle? To... to... Pokrov. Get in, Anakushka. I'll take you. Oh, I'll sit on the other side off. Other side. Off! Now, now, mind you, drive quickly. The cab drove off. Where did they come from? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Hadn't we better go there? Where? Why, to Bob Nish, Bob, Bobby, Bobin Nitsins. Bobby Nitsin. Bob, to Bob, Bin, Bo, Bin, Nitsins. Bobo Nitsins. Oh. No, that's out of the question. Why? I would go there, of course, but th then she would tell me some other story. She would get out of it. She would say that she had come on purpose to catch me with, with, some, with someone, and I should get into trouble. And, you know, she may be there, but you, I don't know for, for what reason why you might go to the generals. But, you know, he has moved. That doesn't matter, you know. She has gone there, so you go too. 
Don't you understand? Behave as though you didn't know the general had gone away. Go as though you had come to fetch your wife, and so on. And then? Well, and then find the person you want at Bobinitskin's. Tafu! Damnation! Damnate! Tafu! Tafu! Damnation take you! What a senseless... Well, what is it to you, my dear... My finding? You see? You see? What? What, my good man? What? You're on the same old tack again. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. You ought to be ashamed, you absurd person, you senseless person. Yes, but why are you so interested? Why do you want to find out? Find out what? What? Oh, well, damnation take you. I have no thoughts for you now. I'll go, I'll go alone. Go away. Get along. Look out. Be off. My dear sir, you are almost forgetting yourself, cried the gentleman in the ra in raccoon in despair. Well, what of it? What if I am forgetting myself, said the young man, setting his teeth and stepping up to the gentleman in raccoon in a fury. What of it? Forgetting myself before whom? He thundered, clenching his fists. But allow me, sir. Well, who are you? Before whom I am forgetting myself. What is your name? I don't know about that, young man. Why don't you want, why do you want my name? I cannot tell you it. I better come with you. Let us go. I won't hang back. I am ready for anything. But I assure you, I deserve greater politeness and respect. You ought to never, never lose your self-possession. And if you are upset about something, I can guess about what. I can guess what about. At any rate, there is no need to forget yourself. You are still a very young, very, very young man. What is it to me that you are old? There is nothing wonderful in that. Go away! Why are you dancing about here? How am I old? Of course, in position, but I am not dancing about. I can see that. But get away with you! No, I, I'll stay with you. You cannot forbid me. I am mixed up in it too. I will come with you. Well then, keep quiet. Keep quiet. Hold your tongue. They both went up the steps and ascended the stairs to the third story. It was rather dark. Stay. Have you got matches? Matches? What matches? Do you smoke cigars? Oh, yes, I have, I have. Here they are, here they are, here, stay. The gentleman and the raccoon rummaged in a, fl in a fluster. Pfft, ooh, what a senseless damnation. I believe this is the door. This, this, this? This, this, this. Why are you bawling? Hush! My dear sir, overcoming my feelings. I, you are a reckless fellow, so there. The light flared up. Yes, so it is here. So it is. Here is the brass plate. This is the Bobaniskis. Bobaniskins. Do you see Bobaniskin? I see it. I see it. Hush. Why is not? Why has it gone out? Yes, it has. Should we knock? Yes, we must. Responded the gentleman in raccoon. Knock then. No. Why should I? You begin. You. You knock. Coward. You are a coward yourself. Get away with you. I almost regret having confided my secret to you. You, I, what about me? You've taken advantage of my distress. You see that I am upset. But do I care? I think it's ridiculous. That's about it. Why are you here? Why are you here too? Delightful mortality, morality, observed the gentleman in, the ra in raccoon with indignation. What are you saying about morality? What are you? Well, it's immoral. What? Why to think you're why to think you're thinking every deceived husband is a noodle? Why are you the husband? I thought the husband was on the Vronsky bridge. So what is it to you? Why do you meddle? I do believe that you are an, you are the lover. Listen, if you go on like this, I shall be forced to think that you are a noodle. That is, do you know do you do you know who? That is, you mean to say that I am the husband? Said the gentleman in the raccoon. Stepping back as though he were scalded, he were scalded with boiling water. Hush! Hold your tongue. Do you hear? It is she. No. Tafu! How dark it is! There was a hush. A sound was audible in the in Bobaniska's flat. Why should we quarrel, sir? Whispered the, gen the, the gentleman in raccoon. But you took all. You took offense yourself. Damn it all! But you drove me out of all patience. Hold your tongue. You must admit that you are a very young man. Hold your tongue. Of course I share your idea that a husband in such a position is is a noodle. Oh, will you hold your tongue? Oh. 
But why such savage persecution of the unfortunate husband? It is she. But at that moment, the sound ceased. Is it she? It is, it is, it is. But why are you, you worrying about it? It is not your trouble. My dear sir, my dear sir, muttered the gentleman in raccoon, turning pale and gulping. I am, of course, greatly agitated. You can see for yourself my ad abject position. But now it's night, of course. But tomorrow, though indeed we are not likely to meet tomorrow, though I am not afraid of meeting you, and besides, it is not I, it is my friend on the Vronsky Bridge. It is really he. It is his wife. It is somebody else's wife. Poor fellow. I assure you, I know him very intimately. If you will allow me, I will tell you I will tell you all about it. I am a great friend of his, as you can see for yourself. Or I shouldn't be in such a state about him now. As you see for yourself, several times I said to him, Why are you getting married, dear boy? You have position. You have means. You are highly respected. Why risk it all at the caprice of coquetry? You must see that. No, I'm going to be married, said he. Domestic bliss. Here's domestic bliss for you. In the old days, he deceived others' husbands. Now he is drinking the cup. You must excuse me, but this is this explanation was absolute, absolutely necessary. He is an unfortunate man and is drinking the cup now. At this point, the gentleman in raccoon gave such a gulp that he seemed to be sobbing in earnest. Ah, damnation take it all. There are plenty of fools, but who are you? The young man ground his teeth in anger. Well, you must admit after this that I have been gentlemanly and open with you. You take such a tone. No, excuse me. What is your name? Why do you want to know my name? Ah, I cannot tell you my name. Do you know Chambrin? The young man said quickly. Chambrin? Yes, Chambrin. Ah, saying this, the gentleman in the wadded overcoat mimicked the gentleman in raccoon. Do you understand? No. What Chabrin? answered the gentleman in raccoon in a fluster. He's not Chabrin. He's a very respectable man. I can excuse your discourtesy due to the tortures of jealousy. He's a scoundrel, a mercenary soul, a rogue that takes bribes. He steals government money. He had to be up for it. For He'll be up for it. He'll be had up for it before long. Excuse me, said the gentleman in the raccoon, turning pale. You don't know him. I see that you don't know him at all. No, I know him personally, but I know him from other. I know I don't know him personally, but I know him from others who are in close touch with him. From what others, sir? I am agitated, as you see, a fool, a jealous idiot. He doesn't look after his wife. That's what he is. If you'd like to know, if you'd like to know, excuse me, young man. Are you? You are grievously mistaken. Oh, oh. A sound was heard in Bobaniskin's flat. The door was open. Voices were heard. Oh, that's not her. I recognize her voice. I understand it all now. This is not she, said the gentleman in raccoon, turning white as a sheet. Hush! The young man leaned against the wall. My dear sir, I am off. It is not she. I am glad to say. All right, be off then. Why are you staying then? What is that to you? The door opened, and the gentleman in raccoon could not be refrained from dashing headlong downstairs. A man and a woman walked by the young man, and his heart stood still. He heard a familiar feminine voice, and then a husky male voice, utterly familiar. Never mind, I will order the sledge, said the husky voice. Oh, yes, yes, very well, do. It will be here directly. The lady was left alone. Galfria! Where are your vows? cried the young man in the wadded overcoat, clutching the lady's arm. Oh, who is it? Is it you, Tavorogov? Tavorogov. 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 My goodness, what are you doing here? Tavorogov. Who is it? Who is it you have been here with here? Why, my husband. Go away. Go away. He'll be coming out directly from in there, from the Polotskins. Go away. For goodness sakes, go away. It's three weeks since the Polotskins moved. I know all about it. Aye! The lady dashed downstairs. The young man overtook her. Who told you? asked the lady. Your husband, madam. Ivan Androvich. He is here before you, madam. 
Ivan Androvich was indeed standing at the front door. I, it's you, cried the gentle gentleman. I, it's you, cried the gentleman in raccoon. Ah, c'est vous, cried Galfria Petro, Petro, Petronova, Petrovna, Petrovna, rushing up to him with her unfeigned, unfeigned delight. Oh dear, you can't think what it, what's, what has been happening to me. I went to see the Poliskins. Only fancy, you know that they are living now by the, by, Alskama's bridge? I told you, do you remember? I took a sledge from there. The horse took fright and bolted. They broke the sledge, and I was thrown out about a hundred yards from here. The coachman was taken up. I was in despair. Fortunately, Monsieur Torvrogov... What? Monsieur Torvrogov was more like a fossil than Monsieur Torvrogov. Monsieur Torvrogov was more like a fossil than like Monsieur Torvrogov. Monsieur Tovrigov saw me here and undertook to under escort me, but now you are here, and I can only express my warm gratitude to you, even Ilyich. The lady gave her hand to the stupefied even Ilyich and almost pinch pinched instead of pressing it. Monsieur Tovrigov, an acquaintance of mine, it was at the Sopovo's ball we heard that the we had the pleasure of meeting. I believe I told you. Don't you remember, Coco? Oh, I remember, of course. Of course. Ah, I remember, said the gentleman raccoon, addressed as Coco. Delighted, delighted. And he warmly pressed the hand of Monsieur Torovkov. Who is it? What does it mean? I am waiting. So, who is it? What does it mean? I am waiting, said a husky voice. Before the group stood a gentleman of extraordinary height. He took out a lorgnette and looked intently at the gentleman in the raccoon coat. Ah, Monsieur Bobaniskin twittered the lady. Where have you come from? What a meeting! Only fancy I have just had an upset in the sleigh. But here is my husband, Jean. Monsieur Bomaniskin at at uh, Corbonneau's ball. Ah, delighted, very much delighted. But I'll take a carriage at once, my dear. Ah, yes, Jean, do. I still feel frightened. I'm all of a, I'm all of a tremble. I feel quite giddy. At the masquerade tonight, she whispered to Tov Tovrogonov, Goodbye, goodbye, Mr. Bobaniskin. We shall meet tomorrow at the Karpov's ball, most likely. No, ex no, excuse me. I shall not be there tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow. If it's like, if it is like this now, Mr. Bobanovsko muttered something between his teeth, made a scrape with his boot, got in, got into his sleigh, and drove away. A carriage drove up. The lady got into it. The gentleman in the raccoon coat stopped, seemed incapable of making a movement, and glazed gazed blankly at the gentleman in the wadded coat the gentleman in the wadded coat smiled rather foolishly i don't know excuse me delighted to make your acquaintance answered the young man bowing with curiosity and a little a little intimidated delighted delighted i think you have lost your your galosh oh yes thank you thank you i will meaning i meet, keep meaning to get rubber ones the foot gets so hot in rubbers said the young man apparently with immense interest Jean, are you coming? It does It does make it hot. Coming directly, darling. We're having an interesting conversation. Precisely so, as you say. It does make the foot hot. But excuse me, I... Oh, certainly. Delighted, very much delighted to make your acquaintance. The gentleman in raccoon got into the carriage. The carriage set off. The young man remained standing, looking after it in astonishment. <laughs>